Welcome to Ozark First Assembly. We're so glad that you're here with us today. If this is your first time with us, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. We hope you feel at home here today. We want to let you know about a few things coming up here at OFA. Be in prayer for our Impact Girls as they go to Girls Camp this week. Pray that they have a safe trip, but most importantly, have an experience with Jesus. Men's Encounter is September 23rd through the 25th. Sign up at the Welcome Center. The cost is $130 per person. A $50 deposit is due by August 29th. See Pastor Brian for more info. Ladies Retreat is September 16th through the 18th. Sign up at the Welcome Center. The deposit of $40 is due Wednesday, July 28th. See Julie Watley for more info. July 30th through August 1st, we will be hosting the Dothan and Enterprise Section's Kids Blast. This is a three-day kids crusade for the churches in our area. Services will start at 6.30 Friday and Saturday and air normal time of 10.30 on Sunday morning. This is an incredible opportunity to invite families in our community to have a fun field event and have a gospel message presented to them. Our Wednesday night meal is this week. It starts at 5 p.m. Be sure to sign up at the Welcome Center. Have you ever wanted to fly? This Friday, our ladies are invited to go to SoFly Bungee Fitness at 8.30 a.m. This is a free class, but we need you to sign up at the Welcome Center. Come to have fun and laugh with us. Join us tonight at 5 p.m. for our prayer service. We will be having a time of worship, devotion, and time of guided prayer. Join us as we seek God for amazing things in our church and community. Be sure to check us out on our website and Facebook page for more announcements and to stay better connected. Again, thanks so much for being with us today. We were expecting a great service. There's just one announcement that we didn't have on our video announcement that I want to make known to you, and that is that we are beginning a program in the church. It's actually you version. Um, if you have any questions about it, Miss Sylvia can answer those questions. But what we're doing, making it available, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday, sermon notes, that you'll be able to have that on your phone. What you need to do is you need to download the YouVersion Bible app. Not only will we have the sermon available for you, notes available on Sundays, but also we will be able to digitally share prayer requests. You can become a friend of the church and we can keep up with our prayer requests on a digital basis. There are information sheets out in the foyer that explain the steps that you'll need to go through the process of becoming a friend of the church and using the YouVersion Bible app. If you have any further questions or you can't figure it out, uh, you can see Miss Sylvia. She can answer those questions for you. But you see the screen there. It's what we'll be doing. So just want to let you know that. God is good. Amen. Take our Bibles this morning and together can we turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. As you're turning there this morning. Do not have the sign up list out in the foyer at this time. But it will be out there tonight. But we are looking for individuals in the church that would be willing to give of their time to help us with just general maintenance. And what I mean by general maintenance, changing light bulbs, maybe some stuff outside, some stuff inside, just general stuff that it just takes an individual there to help. If you would like to be a part of that ministry, because that's what it is, it's a ministry of upkeep of God's house. If that's something that stirs your heart and something that you would like to be a part of, you can see me this morning as you're walking out. Let me know. Make sure I get your name, contact information, and then we'll have the sign-up list out in the foyer tonight. We're just looking for individuals to help us with the maintenance of the church. So if that's something that you're interested in, please, please let, let us know. Also, we're having... Sectional Kids Crusade, the last Sunday of this month. It starts on that Friday. Guys, let's blow it out. And what I mean by that, not blow it up, blow it out. Okay? Y'all get that reference, right? We're not blowing anything up. We're wanting to blow it out that we've got so many people here, we're blowing the doors out. Y'all get that connotation, right? I've been told I need to stop calling inflatables blows-ups in the times that we live in. Right? Some of you are awake this morning, you'll get that later. 
But our Kids Crusade is the last Friday of this month, the, the sectional Kids Crusade, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday. They're going to conclude it, but Pastor Vint Norris, our children and educational pastor for the state, is going to be here. Him and Matt are going to lead the service the last Sunday of the month. But invite kids. Invite kids. Now, if they're going to other churches, don't invite them on Sunday. Okay? They need to go to the church they belong to. And they're associated with and connected with. If they're not going to church, we need them here. Amen? Amen. Not only we minister to the kids, we can minister to the parents. So invite the family to come and be a part of this. The last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this month. If you have any questions, see Pastor Matt. In fact, next Sunday, he's going to come. He's not able to come then this Sunday morning. He's in kids' church by himself, so pray for him. Amanda's at the campground for our girls' retreat. and She's getting things ready for them. Uh, But next Sunday, he'll come in and give a good push for that. But please, go ahead and start inviting now. And if you have any questions, see Pastor Matt. Well, this morning, Numbers chapter 14. Let's begin reading with verse 20. So the Lord said... I have forgiven them in accordance with your word. However, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Certainly all the people who have seen my glory and my signs, which I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who were disrespectful to me see it. But as for my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. Can we pray together? Father, we thank you. For your word. Your word is profitable. And Lord, I pray this morning that your word would stir within us the response of faith that opens our heart, that the seed of your word may be implanted within us and it may put down roots and sprout forth and produce the fruit of righteousness, Lord, that you have sent it forth to do. Because you are the God who continues to perfect the work that you have begun in us by faith. And I pray this morning that your word may go forth, and that, Lord, it may do the work that you have called it to do in each of our hearts individually, but also collectively in our hearts as a fellowship of the body of Christ, to bear forth witness of your gospel in this community and beyond. We ask it, we pray it, as we yield our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said in agreement, amen. Amen. God himself, here in verse 24, calls Caleb's spirit different. Note that. He calls Caleb's spirit different. Meaning, it was not the same as everyone else. It did not look like nor act like Everyone else, it was distinct. When that word spirit is used in the Bible, and and distinctly here in the Old Testament, it can refer to our rational mind. It can refer to the center of our senses, our affections, our emotions. It can also be used to speak of our human will, of our intellect, and of our personal disposition. Dispensation or disposition. And God is calling attention above all of the others that he is making reference to. God is calling attention to Caleb's spirit. He is calling attention to his will, to his disposition, to his mind. And since God himself is calling attention to Caleb's spirit and calling it different, it's important that we as his children pay attention to what made his spirit different and distinct. (coughs) 
The context of the passage this morning, it comes from Moses sending out 12 spies into the promised land. The first generation that God has delivered out of the nation of Egypt has set them free. They have finally come to the place of their destination. The things that their fathers, their grandfathers, their great-grandfathers had spoken to them that God had promised to their father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who was later renamed Israel had come to pass. And they're waiting and Moses sends these 12 spies into the nation to spy it out. See what the land is like. See what the people are like. How they're living. Are they living in tents? Are they nomads? Or are they living in fortified cities with walls? And when the spies returned from surveying the land of Canaan for 40 days, as we read, they gave a report when they returned about their experience. And we find this account in Numbers chapter 13, distinctly beginning with verse 26 all the way to the end. And they reported in verse 27, if you've got your Bibles open, look. Numbers 13, 27, notice the first words out of their mouth when they came back and they reported what they had experienced in the land. They told the people in Moses, certainly the land flows with what? Milk and honey. It is everything God said it would be. In fact, I would say when they came back, it's everything God said it would be and it has exceeded our expectations because that's the God we serve. His promises go beyond our expectations because His ways are higher than our ways. However, we know that the story of How ten of the spies, minus Caleb and Joshua, discouraged the nation from following the commands of the Lord and to go and to possess. Let's pick the story up in Numbers 13, beginning with verse 27. These are their words after they said, the land is everything God said. And in fact, we can infer it's everything. It's gone beyond our expectations. And if they would have just stopped there, everything would have been great, but they didn't. In verse 28 it says, Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified, and they're large. And indeed, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the giant, the big people who are are skilled in warfare. They go on and said, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will certainly prevail over it. Notice his distinct spirit coming out here. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people because they are too strong for us. So they brought a bad report of the land which they had spied out to the sons of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are people of great stature. We also saw there the sons of Enoch, the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our sight. Now notice that it's important to read their words, what they said about themselves, how they viewed themselves. We are as grasshoppers in our own sight before them, and so we were in their sight. As we've read here, they talked about how strong the people of the land were. They talked about how big and fortified their cities were. In fact, they listed all the armies of the land that had great reputation. The problem in the land was not the giants. The problem in the land was not the cities. The problem God is noting here was their spirit. That was the problem, not the people of the land, not how big they were, not how strong they were, not how big and fortified their cities were. That was not the issue. The issue of God's people was their own spirit before God. 
They declared, unlike Caleb and unlike Joshua, that God was not sufficient. Now, they didn't say it per se in the words that came out of their mouth, but that was the spirit of the words they said. They were declaring that God was not sufficient to bring the task to completion. The task of possessing the land. Verse 31, look at it again. They said, we are not able to go up against the people because they're too strong for us. And the question that comes to my mind through their words, and even as I've read this, is when has God ever called us to do anything for His kingdom that wasn't bigger than we are? When has He ever called us to do anything that when we look at it, it doesn't call us to sit down or fall to our knees and say, oh my goodness. Because it's so much bigger than we are. It's interesting when we look at how the ten spies identified the land of Canaan. Verse 27, going jumping to verse 27 again. They said, the land where you, talking to Moses, (laughs) sent us. And then skip down to verse 32. The land through which we have gone. Now notice that. The land that Moses, you sent us to spy out, and the land which we have spied out. What they should have been saying, the land which the Lord our God has given us. That's not name it, claim it. That's not trying to speak something that isn't. That was the words of faith. This is the land God has given us. This is the land God had promised Abraham, Isaac, Israel, our father, our grandfather, our great-grandfather, the generations that went back. This is what God has said. This is the land that God has given us. But they didn't. They said, the land, Moses, you have sent us to. It's the land that we have walked through. Instead of, it's the land that the Lord our God, our Heavenly Father, has given us. And their words gave away the condition of their heart. Their words gave away that we've just read the condition of their spirit before the Lord. Because these ten, mer- these ten men, these ten spies, they were walking by this kind of spirit. They, they were unable, because they were walking by this kind of spirit, they were unable to believe God's promise. They looked at the people of the land and what did they see? They saw giants. They looked at the Canaanite cities and what did they see? They saw high, fortified, unpenetrable walls and locked gates. They looked at themselves and what did they see? Insignificant grasshoppers. And because these were the things that occupied their heart, their spirit, they lost Heart. They lost heart. And this caused them to fear what they had once hoped for. Now hear that. What they had once hoped for, because they had this spirit within them, caused them to fear what they once hoped for prospect of entering the land and fighting the enemy overwhelmed them. It was more than they could comprehend, more than they could really wrap their mind around. And like a cancer, discouragement quickly spread throughout the camp. And doubt turned into unbelief. And unbelief led Israel to rebel against God. And this spirit from these ten men that were transferred onto the nation because their hearts were there. Transferred onto them. This spirit led the whole congregation to criticize Moses, to criticize Aaron, you know the story, and lament the fact that the nation had not died in Egypt where they were in bondage. It would have been better, you know, to have died in Egypt. It would have been better to have died in the wilderness. 
Because when our eyes are focused on self, when our eyes are focused on us, when our eyes are focused on our circumstances, we lose our perspective and we can say and do some foolish things. Have you been there? I've been there. I've been there. When I set my eyes and I set my heart on myself and I set my eyes and my heart on my circumstances, I can say and do some foolish things. And amidst this grumbling and amidst this complaining, Caleb's different spirit responds. Hang with me. We're just peeling through the story to set up a context. His different spirit responds again to their faithless and their hopeless lament. Look at verses 6 through 10 of chapter 14. Caleb speaks up in the midst of They're complaining and griping and blaming Moses and Aaron. The Bible says in verse 6 that they tore their clothes. Verse 7, and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Caleb and Joshua, saying, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. What was the definition of the land by the ten spies? It's a bad land. Yes, they said it. It it flowed with milk and honey, but it's bad. It's not good for us. It would be bad for us to try to possess the land. But what does Caleb and Joshua say? Caleb had a different spirit. He reaffirmed God's promise because his eyes were on the Lord and not on the people, not on the circumstances, not on the city. And he says, it is an exceedingly good land. Verse 7. Moving on, he says, if the Lord, and this is key, if the Lord is pleased with us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Again, he signifies his different spirit because where is Caleb's eyes? Where is his heart? Where is his focus in life? It is not on the people of the land. It is not on the fortified cities. It is not on the difficulties. Caleb is not denying that they're going to have to fight for the land, but what he's saying instead, this is the land that God has given us and we are more than able to take hold of what the Lord has promised that was his different spirit and he goes on verse 9 only do not rebel against the Lord do not fear the people of the land for they will be our prey why not because of their strength but because of our God their protection now notice this this is key Their protection is gone from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. Caleb and Joshua. They tore their clothes, which we know when we look in the Old Testament, that's a sign of mourning. They were mourning the death of faith. They were mourning the death of hope. And as they mourned, they were trying to revive what was dying. What was dying was their faith. What was dying was their hope. And as Caleb and Joshua were mourning through through ripping their clothes, because that's what it signified, they were trying to revive what was dying. And they described the land to be exceedingly good. And they reminded the people that the land still flowed with milk. It still flowed with honey. It was everything that God said it was and even more. And Caleb presented the picture before the people. He presented the picture of what the land is, is that it was good. But not only a picture that the land was good, notice that Caleb, he presented the correct posture before the people. And the correct posture was of a movable spirit of faith and hope toward the Lord. When they scouted out the land, their eyes didn't focus on the things. Their eyes focused on God and the promise that He had given. They spoke to the people saying that it was still possible. Look, in essence... We've stumped our toe. We've all stumped our toe. Is there anybody here? Don't raise your hand. 
Is there anybody here? I better put my hand down. Is there anybody here that hasn't ever stumped their toe? We've all stumped our toe, haven't we? Have you ever had one of those out-of-body experiences? This is a short pig trail, and I'll come right back. But have you ever had one of those out-of-body experiences that you heard what you said? Have you ever had that? Well, I have. It's not a pretty picture. <laughs> like, did I just say that? I'm talking about the spirit of what I said, not what I said. So no, the pastor wasn't saying things he shouldn't have said as far as words. But the spirit of it had that out-of-body experience in it just like, I cannot believe I just said that. And Caleb was saying, look, we've stomped our toe. All of us have done that. But we can fix this. It's not too late. We can fix this. We've stumped our toe, but we can fix it. What we need to do is we need to turn back to our gracious Heavenly Father because you know, guys, we have seen His grace in the wilderness. We grumbled, we griped at the bitter water. And what did the Lord do when He tested us there? He gave us sweet, sweet water that we could drink of and led us to, to this oasis in Elam. But He also revealed His name, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. The Lord our healer. Oh, He gave us manna. And when we complained about that and we wanted meat, He gave us meat. We've stumped our toe, but we know we serve a gracious God. Come on, let's just get it right. Let's just get it right. Let's not get, in essence, beside ourselves. Let's get back to being beside the Father. The posture of faith is what opens our lives to God's favor. As we've seen this morning, you said, I believe. We do not live on explanation. We live on promise. That's why it's so important. How can we live correctly? How can we navigate this life if we are not filling up our minds and our hearts with this? With God's Word. Why? Because, why is it so essential? Because we do not live on explanation and there is so much in this life we can't explain. Amen? So much we can't figure out. But thank God we don't live on explanation. We live on promise. Even as we are facing hardship and tough, difficult situations, we don't lose hope like Caleb. We can have a different spirit because why? We live on promise. That's what Caleb's focus was. You know, God gave him the land, but he never said he did. they didn't have to fight for it. The posture of faith is what opens our lives to God's favor. I'm hurrying. And Caleb is in essence saying that there's two things that are needed. First, we need to stop our rebellion against the Lord. And we need to cease being afraid of the good land and turn back to God. And the depth, the depth of the faith and the hope of Caleb and Joshua is seen particularly in verse 9. I said, take note of verse 9, but let's look at verse 9 again because it speaks of the depth of their faith and their hope in their God because they said, do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land for they will be our prey. Their protection has gone from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Their protection. And what is interesting about that word, the word protection, is that in the Hebrew, what it would often convey is the word of shadow or shade. So the concept of a shadow or shade was brought about when this word protection in the Hebrew was used. So in essence, where were they? They were in the wilderness, weren't they? They're in a place that is hot. They're in a place that is arid in this region in Middle East. And they understood this word of protection because it was the understanding of shade and shadow. And when you're in the desert and you find a shade or a shadow, that's a good thing, isn't it? It protects you from the sun. Come on now, we got some pretty hot days here in L.A., don't we? In July and in August. And if you're outside working in the hot sun... 
and you take a break, you don't want to just stay out there in the boiling heat. If you're taking a break, let's find an oak tree or something that's got a little bit of shade I can get under and get some protection from the sun that is beating down upon me so I can find refreshment. And Caleb was saying here, their shadow, their shade, their protection has been lifted because God's the one that has removed it. Therefore, we are more than able to take this land. Let's go and stop debating it. God said it. Don't debate it. Just do what he said. If I could get that through my thick head. Stop debating it. If God's already said it, don't debate it. Just obey it. I love Psalms 91 verse 91. We've quoted this a lot, especially in what we've walked through. He who dwells in the shadow of the Most High will abide in the shadow, right? Those that abide in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow, that sense of protection. The people of the land's protection had been removed, but God still covered his people. He still covered his people. We know that without faith, it is impossible to please and obey God. It's impossible. It's impossible without faith to please God, especially in the face of problems and in, in, in the face of, of, of contradictions of life. Without hope, it is impossible to trust. Without hope, it is impossible to obey God when we're walking in the unknown. And there is so much in our life that we walk in the unknown. But there is one thing that we always know, and that is God says, I will be with you always until the end when I come back down and receive you to myself. God wants to develop our faith. God wants to develop our hope in His character. And that's what the wilderness was all about. The wilderness experience of the children of Israel in that first generation is that they would begin to trust God that in a dry, lifeless place of which they could depend on nothing but God, there's no resources in the desert. They had to trust God. And the wilderness was to cause them to look to their provision. God is their provision. So when they got to the promised land and they saw the people and they saw the fortified cities, they'd say, this is nothing. Because we know what God has already done for us. And it would have been like Caleb. Why in the world are we debating this? Let's stop debating it and let's get on the move. Without faith, without hope, the nation acted the only way that we can in such circumstances. They fell apart. And they chose inaction. And they chose to do without. Notice that. Without faith and without hope in the character of God. Because of the opposition that they saw in the promised land. They acted as the only way in which they could. In such circumstances, they fell apart. They chose inaction. And they did without. But notice what God says again as I'm closing. Asking the musicians to come back. Notice how Caleb's spirit was different. Notice how his spirit was different. And notice what this led to in his life. God came down. The people, now get this. Caleb's standing up for the Lord. Not that God needs anybody to stand up for him. But what Caleb was doing was trying to refocus the people and encourage them, hey, don't go down this road. Let's trust God. He was speaking what was true. He was speaking what was right. He still trusted and believed in who his God was. And even in the midst of that, because of the spirit that the people possessed, they were ready to stone them. They were like, look, let's choose us another leader to lead us back to Egypt. And as for Caleb and Joshua, let's just get rid of them. And God came down in the midst. God had had enough. And we know that because of the words that he said. But notice in verse 24, because of Caleb's different spirit, the distinction that God gave to Caleb, the distinction that he spoke over Caleb. 
Caleb's distinction from everybody else was that Caleb was a servant of God. Notice what God, and he made it personal. What did he say in verse 24? This is my servant, Caleb. My servant. His different spirit led to distinction in his life. Not only distinction, but it led to his consecration, his commitment. And God said, he, Caleb, my servant, has followed me fully. And because he is my servant and because he has followed me fully, he will see the land. And we know at the ripe old age, I believe, of 88, Caleb was in the land and he came to Joshua, his buddy, and told him, look, you know the promise God gave to me on this day we're talking about. And I might be 88 right now, but I am just as vigorous of spirit as I was then. I still have that distinction in my heart. God has spoken it. I am able. Give me what the Lord has promised so that we can begin to possess it. We look through this story and what stirs in my spirit. And this is not a message of condemning. I'm not pointing a finger saying anybody's acting like the first generation. So just get that out of the way. If that's in your mind, just sweep it out right now. What stirs in my heart when I read this story is this. I pray God move me. How many of us pray that? Lord, move me. Lord, move me. I remember distinctly in my life a few years back as I was praying that God dropped this that I'd read in my heart. And the question that, Lord, and no, I did not hear an audible voice, but the witness of His Spirit in my heart that was affirmed by Scripture. That as I was praying, God moved me, the question came, do you possess a movable spirit? You ask me to move you, but do you possess a spirit I can move? Do we possess a movable spirit? Or do we allow the perceived difficulties of the journey to keep us from making the journey that the Lord is calling us to and drawing us to? But God, I see this, I see this, I see this. That shouldn't be our focus. Our focus should be God has spoken. I believe I'm going to move. Paul, when writing at the end of his letter to the Corinthian church, he said this as he closes chapter 16. He said this. He says, I'm going to remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. And then he noted this to the Corinthian church. He says, I'm doing this because... There is a wide door for effective service that has been opened to me. God had revealed this to him. I'm staying in Ephesus until Pentecost because the Lord has revealed to me there is a wide door of opportunity for effective ministry. But notice, that's not where he put the period, if you will. After he said there was an effective service that has been opened to me, he stated this, and there are many obstacles. But notice what he put first. There's the opportunity, and I know there's going to be some obstacles. But God has spoken. I believe I'm moving. Do we have a movable spirit? Do we have a movable spirit? Spirit, we pray, Lord, move us. Lord, move us. Do we have a movable spirit? Do we have a spirit of faith and hope that God is able to move? And that even as we are beginning to walk that journey and circumstances and situations, because the enemy's not going to just let us walk in and possess, he's going to do everything he can to discourage us and dishearten us. Where's our focus? The focus of a movable spirit is God. The focus of a movable spirit is His Word. Oh, there is a wide 
door of effective ministry that God has opened before me. And yeah, I see the obstacles, but I don't see them as obstacles. I see them as opportunities for God to move. Opportunities. Do we have a movable spirit? As individuals. But as a corporate assembly of the body of Christ, that God can move us where He wants to move us in the day and the time that we're living. Father, we come before You. Lord, we thank You, God. We thank You for Your promise that, Lord, that You have given us. The promise that, Lord, that You will abide with us, God, at all times as Your children. There is not a moment that, Lord, that we walk that You are not present. You are always present. In fact, Psalms 46 says you're that present help in our time of need that before we even get to that place, Lord, you're there waiting on us. Lord, as we have looked to this Word, Your Word, Lord, the question is, do we have a movable spirit? Do we possess a spirit of faith and hope that you are able to move? Do we have a movable spirit?